In the future, technology reaches a level where each person has his or her own clone, with the help of which people solve all their problems. 2043. The first manipulators that can be controlled by the power of thought appear. Hundreds of sensors receive signals from different points of the brain. People without the ability to walk will be able to control their artificial bodies. 2046. The invention becomes in demand during military conflicts. Robotic surrogates are now available to all segments of the population and have gained a lot of popularity. One can go out without fear of illness or accident and always look great without gym or cosmetics. The year 2050. An evolutionary leap is taking place. According to the surrogate industry leader, VSI Corporation, 98% of the population has acquired a new body. Society forgets about disease and serious crime. 2054. Riots break out against the settlement of the planet by artificial humans. Opponents of the new world, the so-called dreads, form colonies where surrogates are forbidden to enter and minimize communication with the outside world. Their leader, called the Prophet, calls the clones evil and calls for their destruction. The year 2057, a young man, a representative of the Golden Youth, goes to a nightclub where he meets a girl. The couple secludes themselves on the street, where they are unexpectedly attacked by a real man who destroys both surrogates with an unusual weapon. FBI agents Jennifer Peters and Tom Greer arrive on the scene, as the murders have not happened for a long time, but since the surrogate is extremely expensive, such murders are considered vandalism. The agents manage to locate the location of the blonde operator, and the pair drive to the address. Once inside the apartment, the agents find the man, the owner of the girl's surrogate, whose brain has been literally scorched out. Greer returns home and takes his place in the charging closet, and being human, gets up from his special chair and goes to his son's room, and then to his wife, but the woman meets him on the doorstep, not letting him inside the room. Tom suggests that his wife go on vacation, but she is horrified at the thought of having to go without a surrogate for a while, although her husband admits that he misses her. That same morning, the students try to wake up their comrade and discover his corpse in the stimulation chair. The FBI is shocked. Never before has a man died himself. Tom and Jennifer review the latest footage of the blonde surrogate. They manage to get a good look at the suspect and realize that he used an unusual weapon. And then it turns out that the man who died outside the club is the only son of the inventor of surrogates, the founder and former owner of Vertel Self Industries, Lionel Cantor. The agents go to the man's house, but he puts up his son's doppelganger surrogate for the meeting. And then Greer suggests that it wasn't the boy they wanted to kill, but the inventor. He sympathizes with the man because he lost his son too. This shocks the man and his surrogate passes out and the father cries in his chair. Greer and Peters go to the corporation to ask questions about the technology to kill the operators. But VSI representatives say that this goes against the very nature of the technology. Surrogates are perfectly safe. Greer gets annoyed, his attitude to surrogates becomes clear, because he doesn't even know who is hiding under the mask of his interlocutor. The agents go down to the lab, where its head comes to a surprise, the chips of the dead surrogates burn to the ground. He is seen similar in the affected military surrogates. The agents go to the military, where one of them says that such weapons simply do not exist. Back at the office, the agents learn that the perp has been identified as Miles Strickland, who was quickly released. Apparently, the man has an ally in the chain of command. Strickland is put on the wanted list and is immediately discovered. Tom goes to apprehend him while Peter stays at a surveillance center run by one of the few living FBI employees, where he is surprised to learn that technology has emerged that not only allows him to monitor every surrogate, but also to disable them from a distance. Meanwhile, Tom pursues Strickland. The man draws his weapon, resulting in the deaths of several police officers and the helicopter in which Tom's surrogate is flying explodes. However, the agent remains alive, although he loses his arm and continues the pursuit on the territory of the colony, where on defense of the fugitive stands the local population, which destroys Tom's clone. The man barely regains consciousness, while the police, in order to hush up the case, removes the partners from the investigation. Meanwhile, Strickland is found by a seer who wants to know where he got the device and who paid him to kill it, he assures that he knows nothing about the customer, who only communicated with him over the phone, but the man is killed and the device is taken. Tom, while in the hospital, learns of his suspension from the investigation and the denial of a new service body. The man risks going out in person and tries to adapt to an independent life among surrogates. He goes to the colony to continue his investigation and finds himself at a cremation ceremony for Strickland. 
led by a prophet, who calls for followers to come out to rebel against, turning humanity into soulless robots. The agent tries to get through to the prophet, but he is beaten up by guards, and the latter declares that he does not know what he is talking about. Tom is taken away from the colony, but at the exit, he is waiting for a limousine with a very young surrogate Cantor, who is dissatisfied with the investigation. The latter admits that his son was killed in the accident, and suggests that he focus on finding out the origin of the gun. Tom returns home, where he catches his wife's friends having fun with electrical pleasure substances. Tom can't stand it, and beats up one of them. He urges his wife to return to the real world, but her surrogate refuses to get rid of the artificial body, then goes to the room where Tom's wife, mutilated in the accident, is crying in a chair. Meanwhile, a hitman infiltrates the Peters' home, killing the sleeping woman and putting her surrogate under someone else's control. Tom contacts a U.S. Army colonel and discovers that the weapon is a virus emitter that charges the surrogate's operating system with a virus that blocks it from functioning. However, during the development of the weapon it turned out that the virus not only destroyed the surrogate, but also hacked the built-in protection of the operator, killing him. After that, all work in this direction was stopped and the materials were destroyed. In exchange for this information, Tom tells the military that the only surviving working copy of the device is in the possession of the Prophet, who at the same time orders his guards to take the device to Agent Peters. Meanwhile, Peters is examining the FBI's financial records, which her supervisor notices and reprimands the woman. Tom goes to work with his wife, where he apologizes to her for his behavior. He misses her and his son very much. Hearing this, the surrogate passes out, and the real Maggie takes another drug. Meanwhile, the military conducts an operation on the territory of the colony, the results of which reveal that the Prophet is just a surrogate. False Peters discovers that Strickland has recently been working for the FBI, which she informs Tom of. He goes to his boss and tells his conclusions about his venality, and that it was on his orders that Cantor was to be killed. After which he disables his surrogate, hacks into his computer, copies the files confirming his words, and leaves the building before the real boss gets to the phone. At this point, Peters picks Tom up in his car, and after finding a corroborating link between VSI and both gunmaking and dreadlock cooperation, Peter informs him that Tom has been in an accident, after which the accident is arranged. While Tom is recovering from the collision, the surrogate takes his data flash drive and the gun case lying in the back seat, which was given to her by the dreads. Tom tries to pursue the surrogate but fails, Eventually the agent's car flies into a storefront and he has to hide from his co-workers, aided by the lack of a radio beacon in the back of his head. He goes to Cantor's mansion, and Peters takes Bob and the surveillance center hostage. The watcher manages to tell Tom that she has infiltrated the database of every surrogate in the country, and Tom, realizing the danger calls Maggie and asks her to disconnect from the surrogate immediately. The warden having learned of what is happening goes to negotiate with Peters, but she takes him in her crosshairs, it turns out that this surrogate is run by Cantor. Disappointed in his own invention, the scientist tried to limit the use of surrogates, which was not appreciated by his colleagues. He shoots the supervisor, avenging his son. At this time Tom goes to his mansion, but the guards do not let the agent to the scientist. He has to break through with a fight, while surrogate Peters uploads a virus into the main surveillance network. The agent goes into the rooms, sees the vast number of surrogates, and realizes that Cantor was all of them. The scientist admits that he wanted to give bedridden people a chance to live full lives, and didn't plan at all that the others would want to substitute themselves in reality. And now the viral emitter is his chance to cure this disease, by killing everyone who doesn't want to give up their plastic doppelgangers. The system alerts that the virus is fully loaded, and Cantor takes the poison. Tom sits in his chair and takes control of the Peters surrogate. With Bob's help, he manages to lock down the operators, but when it comes to saving the surrogates, the man stops, and then a police sniper destroys Peters, and the process is no longer reversed. Surrogates all over the world are dropping dead. Tom goes outside and sees a lot of bodies. People dressed in house robes come out of the house. Apparently they have not left their dwellings for a long time. The agent runs home and finds his wife standing by the window, they embrace, returning to themselves, against a backdrop of streets filled with disconnected surrogates, a news announcer is heard summarizing the situation. People are going to have to live on their own. An interesting movie that invites reflection on robots and eternal life. Write in the comments what you think about it.